Today we will learn and reflect on the history of the Catholic Jesuit order based on this slender book by Father John O'Malley, the church historian, who's known for his books on the Vatican II and Trent Church Councils. No religious order spawned as much passion and controversy as the Jesuits. What is so fascinating about the Jesuits is how they responded to the modern world and how they differed from the Dominicans and the Franciscans and other medieval monastic orders. Why were they so despised? Why was the Jesuit order suppressed? Why were they persecuted and why were they punished? Were they to blame for their problems? These are difficult questions to answer and perhaps our questions and answers will tell us more about ourselves than the Jesuits, but we'll give it a try. In our thumbnail, by the way, we included both the founder of the Jesuit order, St. Ignatius Loyola, and Pope Francis, who's the first Jesuit Pope. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the source we used for this video. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comment. Let us learn and reflect together. The Jesuit order was formed in 1540, shortly before the Council of Trent was convened. The founder, Ignatius Loyola, was a wounded soldier who decided to change careers and serve the church. He would become the soldier for Christ in the church militant, vigorously advancing the cause of the church, defending the Catholic Church from its enemies. So how was Ignatius Loyola converted? He had served in the military for the small state of Navarre in Spain. During a battle, a French cannonball shattered his legs, leaving him with a lifelong limp. After several excruciatingly painful medieval operations, he recuperated at the Castle of Loyola for many months, with two books at his bedside, excerpts from the Golden Legend of the Holy Lives of the Saints and the Life of Christ by Ludolf of Saxony. He examined his life and prayed and pondered whether he should be a limping soldier or lead a life like St. Dominic and St. Francis. Gradually, he became convicted that God was calling him to a new life. When Ignatius had recovered sufficiently, he set out on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, but was waylaid at a town near Barcelona, partially because of an outbreak of the plague. While living in a cave, he absorbed himself so deeply in a regimen of long hours of prayer and fasting and self-flagellation that he fell into despair, even contemplating suicide but eventually shook off his despair and relaxed his religious regimen. Ignatius enrolled in the University of Paris where one of his roommates was Francisco Xavier, who had become the famous Jesuit missionary to India and Asia. After graduation, ten classmates in all, including Loyola, traveled about Italy and Rome where their order, the Brotherhood of Jesus, was approved by Pope Paul III. The Jesuits share with the medieval orders the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. But in addition, the Jesuits take a fourth vow. O'Malley emphasizes that this fourth vow is not a vow of loyalty to the Pope, as many think it, but rather the fourth vow is a vow to go on mission anywhere in the world, to be ready to travel among the Turks, or to the New World, or to the Lutherans, or to any others, whether infidels or faithful. The Jesuits look to the Pope to send them out on mission, or to the superior general of the Jesuit order. The Jesuits also differed from the older religious orders in that they did not wear a distinctive habit. They did not give up their family name, and they were not required to meet for group prayer several times a day. But the Jesuits did start a modern ministry, the Retreat, based on Loyola's major work, the Spiritual Exercises. And weekend tr retreats today are common. Jesuit retreats can be longer, and are times of self-reflection, similar to Loyola's time of self-reflection when he asked for God's guidance. And many in the 16th century criticized these retreats for under-emphasizing the sacramental and penitential life and over-emphasizing the direct communication of the individual believer with God, which many felt was this false mysticism. And indeed, Loyola's constitutions, the rule for the Jesuits, does not prescribe penances or austerities for the brothers. Now, in addition to their wide-ranging missionary ventures, the Jesuits were also deeply involved in the establishments of schools and colleges. The Council of Trent focused on the need for better education and to catechize the faithful and the clergy. The Jesuits had the highest educational requirements for their brothers. Schools were frightfully expensive, even when the Jesuits were the teachers, especially since the order did not want to charge tuition so that even the poorest could attend their schools. 
Consequently, the Jesuits were forced to become experts in fundraising. Well, Malley doesn't mention this, but probably the Jesuits fell victims to the same tendency in today's nonprofit organizations dependent on fundraising, where the top executives need a large salary to fund a lifestyle sufficient to circulate among the wealthy who needed to fund their schools. And the myth grew that all Jesuit orders printed money in their basements. So their generosity to the students of the poor indirectly stoked the envy of others. The Jesuits marched to wherever the Catholic Church and the Pope needed them to march, and this was the era of the church militant, and the Jesuits were in the thick of the battle, and their enthusiasm likely led to misjudgments. O'Malley does not adequately describe how violently polarized the Protestants and Catholics were at the time. A well-known Protestant book of this era is Fox's Book of Martyrs, it contains one early church example of martyrdom, and the other stories are about Protestants martyred by Catholics. And one of the more memorable stories is how some Anabaptists were tied to a pier in the ocean at low tide, slowly drowning them as the tide came in. Now, the accuracy of these stories are intensely debated, but all of the stories can't be totally false, and regardless of the degree of truthfulness of the stories, the fact that such a book would be so popular is testament to how violently vitriolic these times were. A competition between the Jesuits and the more established orders like the Franciscans and Dominicans can be just as intense as between Catholics and Protestants. In the 18th century, there were intense squabbles between the Jesuits and the Jansenists. The Jansenists were strict Augustinians who believed that free will had little or no power in the sinner's struggle against original sin. The Jesuits were less extreme, quoting from O'Malley. Jesuits and others who ascribed to probabilism taught that in a conflict of opinion among respectful theologians over the morality or immorality of a given act, the confessor was obliged to give the penitent the benefit of the less rigorous option, even if that opinion was regarded as less probable. In other words, the Jesuit philosophy is this. Give the sinner a break. Err on the side of compassion for someone who is indeed voluntarily confessing their sins. Assume the best of the sinner. Assume they're truly repentant and wanting to live a more godly life. Also, the Jesuits respected the pagan Greek and Roman classics as part of their educational endeavors, and this abhorred the Jansenists. And the Jesuits favored more frequent reception of the Eucharist, which Jansenists felt cheapened the sacraments. And O'Malley tells us that to the Jansenists, the Jesuits were compromisers who betrayed the purity of the gospel message and preached an easy road to salvation, so, some Jansenists became obsessed with destroying the Jesuits. And the Jesuits were accused of arrogance. Some saw their very name, the Brotherhood of Jesus, of symbolizing arrogance. The Jesuits were confessors to much of the royalty of Europe. Their perceived wealth, their ties to the Pope, real or imagined, their identification with the monarchy, their popular preaching, and their excellent education, all these factors only increased the envy of many in the Church. One unfortunate lesson of the Protestant Reformation was that if a prince or king converted to Protestantism, he could easily increase his wealth by seizing church properties. And in medieval Europe, the Pope and princes were constantly battling over who could control investitures of church officials. An investiture refers to the appointment of bishops and abbots of monasteries and other church officials. And in this contest, the popes had moral authority, while the monarchs had temporal authorities in their large armies. Like slow-moving dominoes, the Jesuits were banned in one kingdom at a time, their property seized, until a pope was forced in 1773 to formally abolish the Jesuit order. Now, the Jesuits would survive in Russia and Poland under the protection of Catherine the Great, and they were under the radar in America, but eventually they'd be reestablished everywhere. And this illustration and story from Wikipedia is an example of one of the incidents that led to the abolishment of the Jesuits one place at a time. Now, the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars devastated the Catholic Church. All church properties and lands in France were auctioned off. Two successive popes were imprisoned in France. In the aftermath of defeat of Napoleon, the Congress of Vienna in 1814 restored the monarchies to their thrones in Europe, and that included the Pope. And soon after that, the Order of the Jesuits was resurrected. There was institutional memory of the Jesuit Order, but very few Jesuits from before the bands were still alive. So the Order had to be started from scratch. 
and most everywhere where they were before, the Jesuits tried to reestablish their schools, seminaries, and printing presses and churches. But in places like France, they were banished three more times in the anti-clerical climate of the times. O'Malley tells us the story of the Jesuit missionary activities in Latin America, Africa, and Asia in particular. In Paraguay around 1700, the Jesuits were able to organize the Indians into large settlements called reductions, even obtaining royal permission from the natives to bear arms to battle marauders seeking to enslave them. But this permission was soon revoked and the natives were disarmed, and eventually the reductions were dissolved entirely. Also around 1700, the Japanese and Chinese missions of the Jesuits had some success and some martyrdoms, depending partly on who was emperor. The Chinese emperor was friendly to Matteo Ricci and the Jesuits. Matteo Ricci lived at the royal court as a guest of the emperor. He learned Mandarin and Confucian philosophy and created a Chinese rite for the mass. However, two popes forbade the Chinese rites and also the adaptation of elements of Confucianism into the local church, which was the beginning of the end of the Jesuit missionary venture in China. Permitting local rites and customs would later become part of the Vatican II reforms many centuries later. Since they were so heavily involved in higher education and in publication of theological journals, the Jesuits were deeply involved in the intellectual Catholic ferment of the late 19th in the early 20th century that would lead to the reforms of Vatican II. Many of Loyola's spiritual works gained greater circulation, and a congregation of Jesuit leaders issued a decree encouraging ecumenicism with other religious traditions, and a Jesuit refugee service was established as a Jesuit ministry. Now there was some tension with Pope John Paul II, who grew up under communism, and the Latin American Jesuits, who, because of their struggle for their poorer parishioners, sympathized with liberation theology, which attempts to synthesize Marxist and Catholic thought. Their support for the poor did not endear them to the ruling regimes. During the Civil War in El Salvador, the army martyred six Jesuits, including a Jesuit university president. Now, Pope John Paul II came to be a major supporter of the Jesuit order, and the Jesuits mirror the Catholic Church in its membership. Three quarters of the Jesuit recruits now come from outside Europe and North America, so it's a truly global order. Pope Francis is the first Jesuit Pope, and in this video on Pope Francis, we also discuss Apodicida, and that's the Latin American bishops meeting, where the future Pope Francis and the then Pope Benedict spread the message of Apodicida, do not forget the poor. And in a slide from this video, we learn that Apodicida proclaims, Today we want to confirm and promote the option of preferential love for the poor. Concern for the poor is not optional. And Pope Benedict summarizes a primary Latin American theological reflection. The preferential option for the poor is implicit in the Christological faith in the God who became poor for us, to enrich us with his poverty. Now what can we say about the Jesuits? They are a modern religious order seeking its way in an often hostile modern world. Their glories and their failings mirror the spiritual lives of all modern believers in an unbelieving modern world. The Jesuits believe in rigorous education to lift the church out of ignorance, trying to strike a balance between reason and faith, scientific inquiry and tradition, and the temporal and the eternal. We must strike a balance between humility and zeal, for all too often we must discern when it is time to turn the other cheek, and when it is time to overturn the tables of the money changers. And these ponderings on the history of the Jesuits brings to mind the only talk I remember from the Promise Keeper weekends I attended many years ago. This pastor was giving a talk on the spiritual malaise. Pastors often suffer after laboring in the ministry after about a dozen years. He said he was given a name of an older preacher who often helped those ministers stuck in the doldrums catch the wind of the Holy Spirit in their sails again. Now the older preacher first asked him if there were any trysts or romantic entanglements, as there was little he could do in these situations, and he was assured that this was not the case. And so he was invited to fly in and spend a few days with him in prayer and fellowship. And he was told that often a successful minister will in the beginning have some early years of success when the ministry is exciting. The many souls he wins for the Lord brings deep satisfaction and a true sense of accomplishment. And he asked him how his prayer life was, how much time he spent in contemplation and study with the Lord, for its own sake, not so much to prepare for the next Sunday's sermon. For the Lord never really cares so much for your accomplishments, 
for it is through the grace of God you are able to accomplish anything. Indeed, we cannot even breathe if it weren't for the breath of God breathed into our lungs. And we cannot live without our heart beating every single second. So how fleeting are life and its accomplishments. But what God does care deeply about is whether or not we love Him, whether we spend time in prayer pondering on His Word, whether our walk with the Lord is the central path in our short lives here on earth. Now we'll discuss the sources we used for this video. John O'Malley wrote this history of the Jesuits up to the present and also an earlier book on the history of the early Jesuits and we'll do another video on this second book later. There are many excellent history of the Jesuits and if I strove to do a comprehensive study of the Jesuits I would definitely include more sources but I do know that Father John O'Malley is an intellectually honest biographer and historian and I know he does not seek to publish a triumphalist propaganda history of the Jesuits. The YouTube description links to the video script and our blog. Please support our channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed which will earn us a small affiliate commission and please consider becoming a patron of our channel and please click on the links for interesting videos on other topics that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.